Fixed and good. Um, let's get this cooking, shall we? Um, I guess I can't. There, let's get rid of that thing. Alright, so as you guys pretty much know, this is VBA 101, Session 5, the exciting topic of variables, which none of us know anything about, I'm sure. Um, I am, you don't want to know me. <laughs> Kevin Deering. All right. Um, it was kind of interesting putting this together because it uh, helps if it has focus. There we go. Because there was, you know, I mean, you think about the topic variables as, and most of us here are already programming in some aspect. So, you know, like, really, how much is there to know? But I think we'll cover some good stuff. Yes. So, um, you know, overview here, the, the variables are indeed the building blocks for, for programming. Uh, I like to think of them as boxes. Um, but, um, uh, you know, with, uh, without them, you, you pretty much, if you think about it, if you're writing the code, some code to do something, um, a key factor for why you want to code something is so you don't have to do it again in a lot of cases. Well, things change, so without variables, you can't, you'd have to recode it again and again and again. Anyway, um, what? You know, you can read the rest. The uh, variable definition, the definition of a variable is the storage location and associated symbolic name identifier which contains some known or unknown quantity or information of value or values. What? Yeah, I hate definitions most of the time. So, um, I like to think of it as a variable as a box or a container that can be used to contain things. Um, there's all kinds of shapes and sizes and, you know, uh, of them. Um, and we'll get into some of that a as we progress. Um, symbolic name. The, you know, as we all pr pretty much know, an application can have thousands of variables all over the place. Um, and I like to think of an application as sort of like a file cabinet. You know, um, various objects, you have drawers, um, which in, in, actually let me ask, what's the host application that most people do? I think, uh, Access, Microsoft Access is probably what we all primarily code in with VBA. So you can think of like a drawer as a, a module. You know, it could be a form or a module attached to the form or a report or something like that. Um, well, within those, they can contain their folders, individual procedures, um, properties, whatever. And all those things can have variables. Well, some of them, you know, and and as I mentioned in here, you can even the application can actually, in in the uh, in the sense of a file cabinet, you can have variables on top of the file cabinet that everybody can go reach. Globals. So, um, I, don't know, I think it's a good word picture to help understand scoping and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, it's because you can have all these things all over the place, it's really important to name your variables well so that you or somebody else who comes along after you um, can find them and understand what they're for. Um, so that's, that's a huge thing, um, which brings us to, to naming. VBA has its own definitions, you know, well, defined naming rules. You, you know, it has to start with a letter, not a number, but numbers are allowed. The variable names can be, have to be less than 250 characters. Can't be the same keyword as, as, um, 
a keyword in, in the host application or VBA itself or any of the references that you're using. You know, you can't say name a variable left because when VBA tries to compile the code, it's going to go, what? Is this the function left or, you know, um, no spaces or other, well, uh, let me back up and just say that some of the things that I say, I'm not going to get too deep and dirty. So some of the things I say in this class are open for contention or debate. Um, I don't want to go too far and deep because we're talking about variables, not how they coded VBA to do its work, you know. So, um, so generally speaking, no spaces or, or special characters are allowed in the names. Um, underscores and numbers are allowed. Connolly has their own naming conventions, I've been told many times. Um, as you see, I'm still looking for the official definition. Um, and since our two classes ago, I think I've been looking for it. I've made some headway. I think I'm closer. So eventually, after this class, I'm going to post this to, we already talked to him, we'll post it to um, the SharePoint that's created for these classes. And, um, well, I, I won't be able to edit the video, but. Um, we're going to post the uh, references and stuff to the SharePoint. Um, anyway, um, why should we bother having a naming convention? Um, pretty much the, the main thing is, to, at least in my book, is to reduce the, the effort that's needed to understand the source code. Because I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I'll... I coded something when I first came here. I haven't touched it since. If I have to go back in there tomorrow, what the heck did I do? <laughs> you know? But if you give it a name, like, okay, say you're looping over an array or something, you know, lists of items, instead of just I, which a lot of people use, you know, if it's a single, if it's a simple loop or something like one loop, yeah, it's not not exactly hard to determine what's going on. But as soon as you start adding, you know, nesting other things within that loop and other loops within that, man, it gets con you know, it can get confusing. <laughs> yeah. But generally speaking, um, and 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 I'll be the first to say I I'm guilty of doing that at time from time to time, you know, because especially in in this environment in Connolly, we tend to work off the cuff a lot, and where our requirement was due last month, and we're figuring out what needs to be done as we're writing the code. So, um, you know, the, the, and there's all those factors that play into it, but it's, it's really important, like, especially, I spent a week trying to research somebody else's issue <laughs> in their code, and Man, it was like chasing my tail. I mean, I, I'm experienced. That I've been doing this for 20, probably 20 years. So um, I'm experienced at looking through other people's code, even languages that I don't really know, and can follow it. But man, it gets it gets frustrating if you just take an extra minute to say, um, you know, give a, a meaningful name to your your variables, it, it just helps every, people down the line so much. Um, another reason I guess I didn't put up on here for Connolly's naming convention is, um, it, as a programmer, my goal is to do something once and not have to go and do it again. Reusable. Well, as you guys know, we have the global development team here, and Ideally, if 
we're able to create something for our audit, we should be able to pass it up to them so that the other audits can benefit from our work. Um, well, handing it over to them, it'd be great if, uh, well, for them, if <laughs> if they didn't have to go through and try and figure out what's going on and and it's it's sort of um, it tends to become a uh, a dialect. Okay, it's not a language within itself, but like when you're reading code, naming conventions, tend, you know, from programmer to programmer, um, when we're doing our own thing, we have our own dialects. So it can you can get used to it, but if you're used to, you know, down south where they have a, a heavy draw and you come up here, um, it might be a little difficult to understand. Hopefully that makes sense. But anyway, no. Um, <laughs> more about naming later. Um, I'm just going to touch on that briefly. So um, scope or life expectancy, um, I mentioned earlier. What the definition for scope is uh, the context within a computer program in which a variable name is valid and can be used. Again, what? <laughs> Basically rewritten, um, how long and from where can I use this variable? There's, um, and again, this is a general overall statement. There's kind of broke it down into three, three kind of levels. Um, starting at the, at the top there, it, it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's more finite. Um, procedural or local variables. So they're within a block of code, like a, um, you know, a, a, within a click event from a button. You know, it doesn't live outside of that code, um, or function or, you know, whatever. Um, there is one thing that a lot of people, even experienced people don't even know about, um, very uh, static variables within VBA. Other languages use static differently, so it's kind of odd to get used to. Um, but basically, static variables are indeed local to that block of code where it's defined. But the next time, it it it, it retains its value. So let's say, okay, an, an example. I already wrote it down. <laughs> Um, let's say you want to see how many times this function is is called during your, you know, application. You can use the static variable to increment, you know, like an, you know, increment that number each time it's called. Can't think of a good reason for that, but um, one place I do tend to use static variables. I have a, a function that I wrote that I want to see if a file is being created if it's growing, like some other external file is creating a file and it's the file size keeps going up, well, I tend to have my quick little segmented um, function that checks on that, um, sleeps for like a second and then checks it against the file size again, but then it leaves that block of code and goes back to the controlling code and with its answer, yes, it's growing or no, it's not. Um, well, if it's still growing, then I call it again. Well, I already have the initial file size, so it can be a little more efficient because, you know, in that, in that is file growing function, um, I save in that static variable the, the initial size, or the actually the, the last size as it leaves. So it doesn't have to sleep an extra second or however long to to go. It, it can just be a little bit quicker. Um, anyway, module scope. Um, this is basically um, like the file cabinet drawer itself. So Whereas, like, if the folders in there in, in the file cabinet are functions or 
or subs, they can kind of reach, they can reach out of their, their own, um, entity and into the drawer and, and get those other variables. Um, you can, I have it broken out here, um, as private. So you can have private, um, variables from within that drawer or, or module so that nobody else can see it, just the things that are in that drawer. Does that make sense? Okay. If I, if any time I get confusing, which I tend to, stop me, ask me, and I'll restate the question and hopefully answer it <laughs> without additional confusion. <laughs> but, um, Global or public um, variables can, the ones that I mentioned earlier, could be like on top of the file cabinet that everybody has access to. Um, they, that's um, another aspect, and, and we'll see in a, in a minute where these things can, uh, can live, if you will. So, this this slide here shows a couple of Microsoft Access objects, not even close to all of them, just a couple to give us an idea. Bottom line, when we're talking about global variables, which are accessible through the entire application, the, and again, don't argue with me on, on this because I'll, I'll agree there's some other places you can do it, but generally speaking, globals, kind of have to live in a module, and they have to be public. And when I say a module, I don't mean a module that's attached to a form, because those die. Um, so basically, you know, when you're looking in your VBA editor, you've got, within Microsoft Access, it generally lists the forms first, then modules, then class modules. Um, the modules is where you would put your globals. Um, a class object can be global, but it's you still have to um, initialize it first. So it's not truly a global in that sense. Um, either way, I'm starting to split hairs, I guess. Um, any questions before I move on on that? Because no, okay. Yeah, basically, um, you can have a form that doesn't have a module, so there's, it doesn't necessarily have to be any code behind that. Um, most cases, there's going to be. Um, sometimes, you know, if you use a bound form that just shows data, you might not have any code. The form module is virtually identical. Many, again, this is another thing, when you get into it, there's some arguing points, but a form module is basically a subchild of the form. Um, and actually, like, you can programmically access the, uh, that code. Um, so in that, that's where it becomes clear, like the hierarchy. You know, um, a few sessions back, um, I think it was Ron that was mentioning, you know, objects are like, you know, you think of a car, it has a door. Well, that door is an object that belongs to the car. This form module belongs to the form. So you have to access it through the form, unless you're already in that form. The, uh, uh, a regular module. That's um, a regular module is where the, the globals basically have to live. Um, they exist for the scope of, or, or the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, when the application is running, they exist. Um, yeah, so if, if something happens, you get a runtime error or something like that, they'll lose their, um, they may lose their values and such, and you have to reinitialize the the 
the application, if you will. But other than that, they're pretty much global. I mean, if you're if you have a global constant, it's never going to change, so you're not worried about it. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> Did that answer? Okay. Anybody else? At the... Um, I do actually touch on that later. Um, you can in in some cases, but whether you should or not within VBA is well within VBA. I'll flat out take a standpoint and say not a good idea. .dot net happy trails go to town, but VBA is not so. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. I'll, does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I stated restated the question for the video, did I? Um, the question was uh, basically can you initialize and declare or dimension um, a variable at the same time? Um, and the answer is technically in, in most cases yes. <laughs> um, do you want to in VBA? Not necessarily and we'll see why shortly. Cool? Um, good question. The question is, um, why would you want to make something private as opposed to just being public to everybody? Um, memory management is one thing, efficiency kind of thing. Um, depending on the application itself, well, the bigger an application gets, the 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 crazier things can become. So if you have like 900 global variables out there, um, especially like trying to do, just think of it this way, okay, um, without getting too technical, just think of it this way. You're working on this enormous app, and everybody that's worked in it before you has made pretty much everything public. You go to make a, a variable called um, file name. Well, there's already a global out there, but it's being used for something else, not specifically your file. Well, you can't name it file name because that clashes with the other one, so you'd have to name it something else. So now you've got like 20 different versions of a, ver a string variable named file name, and they're all holding on to some memory in the back end. So... Does that kind of answer? Yeah. Well, if it's private, it's, it's going to be cleaned up and go away, yes. So I kind of answered your question from the opposite end. Um, why, I answered why shouldn't you do everything as, as public globals. So basically... Um, in a word, efficiency. Um, but there's a lot more to it than just that. You know, do you have, was that good, you think? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, can you imagine I this and I that? And, oh, and also, um, even if you, like in that example I, I used with a, a file name variable, even if you were to reuse that, unless you know every piece of that code, which I don't even know every piece of my own code in a small application, um, under so many different circumstances, um, if I reuse that, that global that was originally designed for something over here, then unless I set it back to its initial value, then we may have just broken something. So, you know, there's lots of different reasons. Um, my advice is to make it as private as possible. Um, obviously, you have to be able to share values across other objects and stuff, so 
but um, it's I think it's a, a best practice to make it as private as possible. That way, memory's freed up. That way, you don't worry about you know naming you know stepping on other portions of the application and stuff like that. So. All right, let's move on. So. Well, after a code block ends, and we did just kind of touch on this, um, after a code block ends, what happens to the, to the variables? Well, the the most private, the um, the procedural local variables, they're destroyed, with the exception of the static variables, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so whatever memory they were taking up is generally released and now available back to the system um, on a on a you know you go to the middle ground and say like um, let's say a form a variable that you declare at the top of the form as private to that form or even public to that form in that case um, when the form is closed it's going to die too but, um, well, yeah, I mean, pretty much the same thing. And even static variables that are in a form module in a procedure somewhere, or even at the at the module level, it's going to go away after, when the form is closed or um, destroyed. I haven't found a need to do that, but yes, I think you can. I could be wrong. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah, I can't think of a reason that you would, to restate the question for the video, I, I can't, i got to remind myself to do that, obviously. Um, I can't think of a reason you would want to have a static variable defined at a, a form module level, because why not, why wouldn't you just have a, a regular non-static variable. I don't know if there's any performance reasons or anything that would come into play, but again, that's more advanced stuff that the coders of VBA will be able to answer, but not me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, module scope variables within a normal module, if um, they can live on. They can be global, even if they're private to that module. So uh, um, why would you do that? Why would you have a, a, a private variable within a otherwise global uh, object? Well, because certain functions might need to reference that and hold on to a value for later. Does that make sense? All right. Um, so back to our boxes or or what have you. Um, storage capacity and um, data types uh, of variables. Bottom line, um, they can be assigned to different different data types, um, and each one has its own capacity um, as well as other properties and such. Here's this is not. Totally inclusive, but um, you know, here's just a, your basics. Um, you notice the byte is the first one up on the screen. It holds values from zero to 255, and it is pretty efficient in terms of because it doesn't have to hold all kinds of memory available in case we, <clears throat> excuse me, in case the code goes way beyond that. Um, notice, you know, some of the you know, for a byte, it can only be positive. You can't use a negative value. Um, Boolean. I should have hid that uh, in, in the note. I was going to ask if anyone knew what the true value of a Boolean true was, but I already gave you the answer. It's negative 1 in VBA. A lot of people think it would be 1. And, uh, and technically, a lot of times you can ask, like in code, you can get away with using 1. But you shouldn't. That was 
What's that? Yes, correct. Uh, false is zero, yeah. Uh, integer. Uh, integer and longs, they're uh, good types to use. Um, well, I'd stay away from integers because of the, the whole limit. It's 32, almost 33,000 is not a big number, especially with what we deal with around here. Um, even Microsoft Excel no longer is limited to 32,000 rows. So um, I try to stay away from integers, even though I got bit by it a month or two ago. <laughs> um, although, if if you know you're only going to have, like, five, yeah, there's there's no reason not to. But if you're using, like, a, a log ID, you don't want to refer to it in VBA as an integer. SQL Server integer is much different. Its capacity is humongous com compared to VBA. Um, and uh, .NET, the integer is more useful because they've expanded its capacity in .NET, but we're, we don't do that here around here, um, so that's sort of irrelevant. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out on this screen, the prefix. Um, this is because I haven't found Connolly's actual um, naming convention. This is, there's a, a couple of popular, well, there's more than a couple of popular naming conventions. One is uh, Hungarian. Um, and it's just because some, the guy who kind of put it, organized the naming convention was Hungarian. And um, basically, he uses uh, a, pre, a three, usually a three-character prefix for the variable letters. So we know when reading through, oh, this is a this is a boolean. It's it's only going to be true or false. It's uh, a currency. It's you know a single double date, whatever, what have you. Um, so I just put these in here because that's better than putting in. Something. Let me give you an example. Um, and I, I don't. If I'm talking over anybody's experience level, just let me know, and I'll, I'll kind of bring it back. But say you have a form that's bound to a table. First of all, why bound? No, sorry, I digress. Um, if you have a, t a form that's bound to a table or a data source of some sort, with a field in that underlying table named auto ID. Um, on your form, your text box, if you use the wizard, is going to be named auto ID. So now you've got two things named auto ID. We're not, generally speaking, you're referring to sort of the same thing. Unless you want to deal with, like, say, formatting the, the background color or something like that then you have to make sure you're referring to the text box versus the data field. Well, take that a step further, and if you're doing some code to look through these things, if you name your variable auto ID, can you see the confusion level? What are you really dealing with? And it, it gets worse as you deal with objects and, and stuff like that. You know, it just... So it's it's a good idea, even if you don't do the Hungarian notation, like a lot of times, instead of the three characters, I tend to go with one. And a lot of times I'll put, yeah, and I also, because of scoping issues, I tend to do, like if I have a global object, um, I'll, I, you know, I kind of, I'm not as consistent as I should be, but if I have a global object, sometimes I'll use a G as a prefix and then the type so that I know, oh, this is global. Um, other times when I don't use the G, I'll, I'll do like a C because it belongs to the class or an M because it belongs to the module. Um, but, you know. If there's a reason behind it and you're somewhat consistent, other people can pick it up pretty quickly. 
and be able to understand what's going on at least. So, but um, let's see. Oh, uh, the only other thing. On, well, there's two other things I wanted to note on this this screen. Um, about the middle of the screen, decimal. That is indeed a VBA data type. However, you can't declare a variable specifically as a decimal um, because the decimal is actually a sub a subtype of the variant. What? Um, let me back up some. You don't have to declare your data types, your variables, as a specific data type. If you don't, then it's what's called a variant, which is pretty much all-encompassing. And what happens in the background is VBA tries to determine what it actually is. So if you don't do it, then you're letting some guys in some other office who wrote VBA to decide what it is, um, which means it has to execute a bunch of code to determine is this a date, is this a string, is this a whatever. So even though that code executes pretty quickly, um, a lot of stuff adds up, you know. Um, not to mention, if you, if you, the more specific you can be when you're programming, I think the better. Because if you're making the decisions, you're, you're closer to the data and the, and the business logic that you're trying to implement. So, you're going to make a better decision than one of the Microsoft guys that coded. And they can't know every business at all. So we can't. <laughs> but um, so there's uh, – but back to um, the decimal. In order to use a decimal as opposed to um, – like one of the other types, you would have to declare your variable as a variant or just without an as clause, and then use um, the conversion C des. Um, that's a, a conversion method that will convert whatever numbers is within your whatever you pass to that function. It'll convert it into a decimal type. Um, I don't think I've ever used decimal, to be honest. Um, but it's a gotcha. Um, next thing I wanted to mention is floating point. Um, so singles and doubles, you'll notice I have in the, in the miscellaneous column over here. These are floating points. So if you try to do some math, bottom line, what, what the, that means is the internal way that VB, VBA stores that this data is um, it's not a true it's not a number it's it's done by bytes um, think of pi it never ends right how can you how can you um, make sure that that's accurate you're gonna have to round it at some point and that's what these floating points do um, so I'm trying to think of an, a good example, but usually the rounding is only going to be to the next whole number. So 1.362 is generally going to come out, depending on how you're using it, um, it should come out as, what did I say, 1.3. Yeah, it, it, it'll generally come out as 1 if you ask for an integer. Um but there's, if you really want some accurate um, numbers, then you're better dealing with longs or doubles or currency. Um, but there's definitely some rounding that's, that I've been bitten by over my career by using um, doubles, you know, as and trying to do some some accurate, you know, fine math, you know. Um, Dates, uh, uh, it's, oh, um, dates actually are stored internally as a number. Um, I think it's number of seconds since 
um, December 30th, 1899. It could be milliseconds. Um, I think, actually, I think it is milliseconds, but when you're dealing with the date types, you really don't have that grant, grant now. Level of access. That's all, folks. Um, one other thing, string. Um, I had to actually. I had to look up a lot of this stuff because you know you don't generally have to know this. If if you know the big picture, especially with integers, if you know thirty-two thousand, that will save tons of time. But you know, um, strings. I had to look it up. It's about two billion characters. That's kind of impressive, I thought. I, I didn't think it was going to be that long. Um, but so you're good to go for most of what you have to do, I think. Um, and especially currency, you know, I wish I had uh, that much money. <laughs> Fifteen digits to the left of the decimal. What is that, gazillion or something? I don't know, whatever. Even if it were in, like, yen, you know? <laughs> anyway, um, there's some other variable types, arrays. Um, not really going to go too much into that because I think Sergi's going to deal with arrays in session eight. I'll let him have fun with that. But, um, you know, an array is basically a list of values. It can be static um, or dynamic. And now when I say static, I'm not referring to, like, the static variables. I just mean it. it doesn't change, meaning you can, when you define your array, it can be three, it can have three um, elements, thank you, um, and it can never change, or you can define it and say without a number of elements, and then later you can build on to that. Um, it can be multi-dimensional. It's so like a matrix kind of thing. Um, but again, I'll leave that to Sergi. <laughs> um, strongly typed or loosely typed. And you can see I've got an example of the first one here, um, array list as string. That means that all the elements, first of all, that is a dynamic um, uh, declaration there because I didn't put a number of elements within the parentheses. But it's strongly typed because I said as string. So that means that all the elements within that array have to be strings. Or loosely typed, in the bottom example, they're variants. Um, objects, I'll be covering that in session 12. But that's typically when you declare something as an object, it's, it's kind of referring to an internal ID to the actual object elsewhere. Sometimes, it, like when, until you set it, it doesn't know that. So, well, I'm not even, I'm just going too deep here, I think. We'll cover some of that in, in session 12. But anyway, um, an object that is actually different than a variant, but We'll get into that. A variant, like we already mentioned, is pretty much all-encompassing. It can hold anything, any data type, objects, controls, whatever. One thing I I did mention earlier is constants. Um, how are we doing for time? Really? I was afraid I was going to go wrong. Um, the uh, constant, we're almost done, actually, but constant is just that. It's it's not really a variable because it doesn't change values. It's it's good. Um, I use them from time to time instead of making a table to hold my values. <laughs> that you know, I know this path is always here, and you know, it, it's a good like uh, configuration type of thing. Um, Variable decoration or creation. Um, there's early bound and late bound. Um, early bound is when you say as a specific type. That's so that 
the compiler, the VBA internals knows, oh, we need this property, this, this, you know, much memory to set aside for this thing, all that right from the get-go. Late bound is when you don't give the, the type. And um, as an, a side note, we do some VB script around here. VB script doesn't allow you to do strong typing. Everything is late bound. So, um, but uh, here's a couple of quick examples. Early bound. You can see, where's my, there it is. You know, uh, as a date. And then I put this in here because it looks like it's a string, right? But because we we said as date, the internal says, yeah, that's a valid date. Okay, it's a date. And now it's stored as that number from December 30th, 1899, as opposed to these characters. Um, you know, here's just, uh, you know, as booleans, here's a static um, declaration. One of the things, um, there's a constant. You can, in that, in that case, for constants, you have to kind of have to set your, your values there in the declaration. Here's an example of um, auto instancing or where you can, well, actually, here's, here's an example of this um, file system object. You de declare it as the object, and then I have another line here that creates it and in, 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 um, instant, instantiates. Thank you. Um, why don't I just do it like this? Well, because bottom line, when you, the way VBA and v, VB6 and before it works, it in the background, every time, if you were to do this um, public as new, there's some stuff that goes on in the background. Every time that OFSO object or, or variable is used, I don't want to get too far into it, but it, it just adds some overhead. Um, Well, I don't use create object except for VB script because um, I like IntelliSense. Honestly, I don't know if there's a, a difference in overhead or anything. I don't think there is. There might be some. I don't know. But um, now, if you're writing your code to go to VB script, because I'll, I'll write my VB script within Access or whatever, and then change the bindings and stuff and yeah, kind of have to, but um, in the interest of moving on, I'm going <laughs> to, if, if you're, um, here's a late bound. So, in, in, and I have an example, I think it's on the next slide, uh, of where late binding can get us in trouble. Um, and, and I think it's important to go over that. So, um, Ellen, there's your create object. <laughs> but, um, okay, so here's uh, one other thing that, I, that you can declare in one dim, dim or public or private statement multiple variables at a time. Separate, you know, just separate them by commas. Um, however, you got to be careful. Like so, in this line, um, I, it looks like I'm trying to do work with two dates, right? Well, what do you does anyone want to take a stab at what this um, this code will do? This, by the way, debug that print prints something to the immediate window, so it's. Exactly, especially, now, the code that runs behind 
the scenes to determine what kind of data type it is. It's kind of smart. Um, anyone notice something wrong that I put in there? How many days does November have? 30. Um, it, the code that runs behind it to determine how to deal with variance is pretty smart. So if I did 1130, it would indeed come up. Um, no. It would in this in this part it would still come up as a string, but in this, when we try to do some math with dates, then it would if it were a valid date, it would be correctly calculated. But because eleven thirty one is not valid, to answer this question is type mismatch error because it's a string, and you can't do math on a string. At least not that way. So um, this is the final slide. If we all have a minute to go over, okay. <laughs> Option explicit. That, that uh, um, even experienced programmers that I've encountered who are good at what they do um, don't always know what that is. Um, and especially because, for whatever reason, Microsoft chose to not enable that by default. So what am I talking about? Option explicit forces programmers to define all of your variables. Not You don't have to type them. You don't have to say, set it as a type, you know, a string or whatever, but you have to define your name within whatever code block. If option explicit is not turned on, then the biggest thing is like spelling errors. And I have this in this example. Um, at first glance, it's probably hard to see the spelling error. I've got two L's. So in this case, if this were within a procedure, it would never get past this line unless that was a global variable set somewhere else. <laughs> um, so you could be pulling your hair out trying to figure out what was going on. But if you set option explicit on, you're forced to do it, and, um, and and you don't have those those other issues. Um, additionally, if you if there's a, an error like a spelling error, and you don't have op option explicit on IntelliSense, which is when you you type the name of something and you press your your period, it shows you a list of what's available, functions, methods, all that. Well, if there's an error. IntelliSense isn't always going to work. Sometimes it tries to in, in a lot of cases, but if there's an error as silly as a, an extra L in your variable name, it's not going to work, which gets frustrating because I'm lazy and I like the dot. <laughs> um, here's how you set it um, within the VBA IDE. So you know F11 or Alt F11 to bring up your Visual Basic. Uh, development environment. Tools options brings this up and you can see that option right there. Um, first thing I, you should do when you get a new machine or a new install of Access or Office is go there and turn that on. <laughs> that, it's not a requirement and that code will work without it, but in my book it's a requirement. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, ah, I thought that was the last slide. I forgot. Um, can I say it anymore? Why, why should you strongly type your variables? Because of performance and efficiency. Uh, there's, you know, there's also less chance of mismatch errors and such. Um, and then back to IntelliSense because I'm lazy and I like that thing when it works right. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's some additional materials. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording. And if you guys have to go, you have to go. But if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm, I'm available now for however long.
you can keep me away from actual work. I mean, did I say that out loud? 